presenting this on behalf of Simone Berenji, who was a PhD student involved um, with the program. And the, the work that you've seen over the last few days has come about because I had some informal contact um, at Bob Roy and Simons Hill, and then the New Zealand Reno Company got a um, PGP program funded, and they wanted to look at how to increase the amount of wool they could produce because they could see in the future they were getting more um, demand for the wool than they could actually supply. So we set up a number of experiments, um, and they ranged from Lake Heron, and I think Alan Harvey and um, Alistair Black presented material from there that was around Caucasian clover. But I visited each of these properties, and we asked them the question, what is the main impediment to your in increasing production? And they gave us what they wanted to focus on. So it, it depended on where we were as to what we were focusing on. As I said, Lake Heron, it was Caucasian clover. Um, at Simons Hill, it was the, the irrigation and the use of loose and grass mixes. Bob Roy, we saw, um, they really wanted to get the grazing management sorted. We were given the red flag as a hospital pass by um, Richard Subfield at um, Maramore Station, and we had some other work at, at, at other places. But uh, the focus of this talk is actually on Deanmore Station. Um, one of the, the beauties of, of academic research is you can do what you think is right rather than what you think can get funded, and we were fortunate that the funding came along. But really, as an academic, my job is to take information from um, good sources in one generation and pass it on to the next generation and try and get them enthusiastic into um, research. As scientists, we build on the work that other people have done, and that's really what my career has been about, and I'm really excited to see some of the youngsters becoming um, enthusiastic about the high country. And that was part of the goals of this program, was to get some researchers who had an interest in the high country. It was one of the things that NZ Marino was trying to achieve with the, the program as we started. Um, I visited Glenmore Station initially at the request of um, Jeff Morton to say, well, we've got some issues here, what can we do? So we've got a low nitrogen, low pH environment. Um, Jeff looking very happy down a hole. Moderate P levels, but aluminium levels, if you remember yesterday, we heard three as a, a problem, so these were nine. Not a lot of vegetation um, and some soil erosion problems if you start cultivating. So we've heard about all of those issues. And we then set about saying, well, what, what's the research program we could put in place um, with an on-farm trial, as described by Graham this morning. The other issue is we're not the dairy industry. So soil carbon can be a double-edged sword. In our case, soil carbon's a difficulty when it's that thatch at the top that you're dealing with that's been growing for 20 years, not very much, but continuing to build up a, a problem for you. And so we used spray, and I reported on that in the Alexandra conference of how we got rid of that um, with burning and, and removing it. So the resident vegetation was a problem. Um, Lime application across the site is required and inoculation of all of the legumes is required. Then drilling, um, we've obviously the herbicides worked, so we drilled the, um, the sun. You can see moisture there from the 11th of December. The good thing about waiting until when you spray, you hold the moisture and you wait till the soil temperature warms up and then you drill. And that, that may seem a very late date to be sowing in the high country, but it actually guarantees emergence when you've got that moisture in the soil. That's what the resident vegetation did by the 26th of January. It also responded, and yesterday we saw a lot of that hares foot clover, but you didn't see it in flower. That's what it looks like when it goes to flower. Um, and we had our trial plot come up. On the left-hand side there is the lucerne plot, and on the right-hand side the Caucasian clover. The Caucasian looking very good um, after a, 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 only a couple of months, in fact about six eight weeks of growth at that point. And we know Caucasian is a very slow establisher, but when the competition's removed, it worked very well. Establishment of the lupins and the lucerne by March, three months after sowing, and the lupin was the most successful. So as a ground cover, you can see the um, annual balance has done reasonably well, the lucerne and the lotus um, pedunk have done okay, and the white and Caucasian, obviously the Caucasian being the slowest which allowed a lot of resident species and other things to come in and left us with some bare ground at the same time. But they did all successfully establish, and at that point we were waiting to back a winner and see what would happen. Um, the Balanza was very successful in the first year, but didn't really recover after that. Uh, the Caucasian being the slowest, um, a lot of bare ground, and that's four months after sowing. In terms of yield, um, 
the balance supply that, yep, good for one year, and then not really recovering in the second year, the resonant vegetation beat it. Balanza clover is, is what we call rural. Um, it really doesn't handle competition. So as soon as we've got some rainfall and the competition comes along, it's not very successful at its re-establishment, which is why um, it didn't really work. Glen was a higher rainfall environment than we were at um, yesterday when we were at O'Meara Station. The Caucasian clover, um, the second year really kicked into gear and gave us about five tonne of dry matter, off an area that would traditionally produce about a tonne and a half of um, not very palatable material. Um, Lotus doing the same, not recovering from grazing. Their plots were all grazed in common and it's, it's a, a difficulty of grazing. Um, the white clover, oh, sorry, the lucerne, um, similar to the Caucasian, and not, uh, the Lotus and the Caucasian, not really um, expressing itself terribly well, but we had a clear winner, which was the Russell Looper. So for that environment with the high aluminium, the Russell Loop had worked very well. Um, white clover is the other perennial, um, not really producing very much. In terms of what happened to the um, soil by applications of lime, so we used four eighths of lime, um, nothing to four tonnes. You can see that in the top 75 centimetres, we've been able to increase and lift that pH to four tonnes, and the two tonne lifting up to 5.3 but haven't really affected the subsoil for 75 to 150 millimetres, which is often where the aluminium is. There, there isn't a layer of aluminium. You actually have to test the profile to find out where it is. In this case, the top 30 centimetres or the top 40 centimetres had high aluminium. But as we then went down that hole that Jeff was in, you could actually see the pH going up and the aluminium level decreasing. In terms of the aluminium response, the, the lime obviously is the, the key way of, of reducing that um, aluminium. So we're going from that 8 or 9 that we had in the control down to um, less than 3 with 2 tonne of lime. But not between 75 and 150 millimetres. Surface applied lime not really doing the job for us. One of the key re results from that was that the application of lime actually releases phosphorus. People historically in this environment have, have talked about capital P. Capital P was the application of phosphorus to bind up aluminium and then the maintenance fertiliser went on to maintain the growth. If you can release that, that phosphorus by the application of lime, you actually see a lift in the Olsen P. So we've lifted there from um, an Olsen P of around 15 to an Olsen P of 23 simply by the application of two tonnes of surface applied lime. So phosphorus in these environments is often not a problem. They've had a history of top dressing and the phosphorus is actually there but it's, it's bound up with the aluminium. Um, in terms of nodulation, the Caucasian clover um, responded to lime so it, it, it certainly increased the nodulation by the application of lime. Um, also the lucerne, not 40% nodulation initially because in that top soil we've got some lime and it, it's um, responding quite well. The Russell Lupin, as you saw yesterday at the field day, it just nodulates. It's just very happy to nodulate um, in any conditions. And so we end up with the characteristic lucerne plants, the one on the left, affected by the aluminium um, and uh, not nodulated, and the one on the right looking as though it's, it's got its root down into an area where there's, there's um, less aluminium. After three years, the Russell Lupin is all 100% nodulated. The Caucasian clover, um, still around 60% nodulated, but there was virtually no nodules left on the lucerne. And that's actually one of the main failings of the lucerne plant. It's not simply the deformed roots that occur, it's actually the fact that the rhizobia um, don't survive in that acidic environment. So with a, a lucerne type nodule, it sloughs off the nodule each year as it comes into the winter, so the bacteria has to survive in a free living state, and it doesn't in that high aluminium environment, so you don't then get um, the re-nodulation the following year as the plant starts to grow. So that um, spurred some more work, but the key points from that, the Russell Lupin was dominant and persistent, and you saw that. That was the issue that we were given at Glenmore, is we've got hundreds of hectares of this high aluminium soil that's relatively easy and, uh, easily accessible, but not very productive. Our lucerne was there for two years, but high plant mortality, generally because of the lack of nodulation allowing it to continue. The, the pedunculatus failed to persist, and the balancer didn't regenerate. 
Um, the white clover survived and did well in the wet summer. So we're talking about you know, more of an 800 to 1,000 millimetre rainfall environment uh, where we are at Glenmore. So this work actually spurred some of the uh, work that you've already seen through the conference, the Lime Ripper, where we went and said, well, actually, can we modify that top 30 centimetres? And Daniel explained the work that, that happened there. Um, another PhD student, Catherine Wrigley, actually worked on trying to select acid torrent rhizobia, and she worked with some Australians there, and she's recently published on that work showing that we can actually select rhizobia that are torrent of those more acidic conditions, um, higher aluminium, and also we can get loosened genotypes that will do the same thing. Um, talking about persistence, that's what it looked like at the end of year five. So it's fairly clear that the, the lupin was the winner. Um, and in that case, the other thing that it highlights is the lupin hasn't moved very far. If you graze it in its flower and you can actually control where it goes to, that's the sowing rate experiment that I reported in 2014 and the, the lupins haven't moved very far from there. On farm, the farm has actually planted 120 hectares of lupins. In our environment, it's quite easy. Um, coxfoot's the grass that you, you grow. You don't have to worry about ryegrass here. It's coxfoot that we grow. So we have um, coxfoot and lupin and Caucasian clover. John Caritas a long time ago showed us that Caucasian clover would work. And as I said, science is about building on what other people have shown you. And the Caucasian clover is the plant that will survive here. There's not a value proposition yet. If we're going to get Caucasian clover to work, we have to produce seed for it. But it works in this environment and it works very well. Um, four months after sowing, you can see the lupins there. They're being grazed in 2016 at Glenmore. And um, by the end of 2017, at year four, then we've got a persistent um, plant. The animals have come in, they've eaten all the vegetation in between, it'll come back and it'll provide good lambing shelter. I took that photo on Monday. Um, that's actually some cattle grazing the, the plots. Uh, just to the right of the screen, you can see where the cattle are dominated is, is Daniel's second trial. The, the fencer actually went right through the middle of his trial. It's one of the hazards of working on farm. Um, and one of the key things was that the, the plants were sulphur deficient and often the high country plants are sulphur deficient. So my take home message, maybe a summary of the, the information we've seen over the last few days, um, lucerne where you can grow it, which leg in where lucerne where you can grow it. Lupins are the winner on high aluminium soils or if you're trying to develop low cost areas with low integration um, in there. Caucasian clover is a high aluminium companion. It survives, the rhizobia survive, and once we get it established, it works very well. Red clover we've seen in the wetter areas, the irrigation areas, and we saw it up um, uh, at Braemar Station. The lamps that we saw at um, Amarama, because it was being oversown very easily, so the practicality is we can just put the, the seed that we've produced on the farm, we can put that in with the fertiliser, we don't have to worry about the inoculant, we can spread it over the hills in a low rainfall environment and allow it to generate. The sub clover survives and can thrive as we saw from Sonia's work and Carmen's work and my plea that uh, this country needs sulphur and lime, it doesn't need a lot more phosphorus. Just to acknowledge Will and M. Murray for letting us on their property, um, Dennis Fastier and David Scott, Dennis for organising things for us, David for the work he'd done previously, and my job is often to be the spokesperson for a team of university staff and students who generate the data for me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Derek. Great to have options now. Let's let's um, open up for a couple of questions. We're on. We're, we're tunnelling into morning tea time here, so this may not be a popular decision, but I think well, we've got to have Derek here, and um, let's take the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, one thing that I appreciate you saying at the beginning is that um, we can select for the science that we do before funding. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the question is, we've seen in the farms all the things that you are showing, like management doing a very good job selecting the right genetics in the, the animals. Um, you working with species and changing species whenever it's needed. But we've seen in these uh, presentations that we can make better ryegrass for water use uh, efficiency. We can do many things within species. Um, the next step on trying to breed under these conditions, 
uh, within species. Uh, what do you think about those? Uh, since companies may not be too much committed to this area, but I think we can make a lot of uh, improvement. Yeah. Um, if you actually look at a lot of the research, genotype by environment, by management, um, the management is by far and away the greatest contributor to change and uh, the wheat work in Australia has shown that, most of the ryegrass work is actually showing that as well. So the management is the key part of what you do and um, I think the lucid work, we, we haven't changed anything except the management. From a breeding perspective, there are some difficult things to deal with. The aluminium is a difficult one. The alfalfa or leucine germplasm, there aren't any, um, there are genetically modified plants coming out of America that may work, um, but that's what we've got to deal with. We've got to deal with plants that can cope with low sulfur and low pH, because the inputs here, the cost of getting things here and putting them on is, is difficult. Um, I've worked predominantly with management and species because there's a much bigger change when I change between species than there is um, within a species. The beauty of New Zealand is what people come to see, but it makes it difficult and challenging for those of us trying to give agronomic advice. It's not a one-shoe-fits-all country. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks.